Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We'll just start in about a minute or so to allow people to enter the webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. It looks like um, the um, traffic has slowed down on the way uh, into the webinar. So we'll go ahead and uh, get things started. Thank you so much for, I understand we're a few minutes late, but thank you for your uh, patience and, and understanding. Um, my name is Heather Iwata. I am one of the graduate advisors in IEOR, along with my colleague, Erica Diffenderfer. Uh, today, we are also joined by our admissions faculty chair, Professor Paul Grigas, uh, in addition to two current PhD students, Ilgen Doan and Tor Notanyahu. Not, sorry, Tor, I just totally butchered your last name. Tor Notanyahu. Mm -hmm. Got it. <laughs> um, and so Professor Grigas will start things off and Ilgin and Tor will be available to answer any questions that you might have um, directed towards their student experience specifically. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end of the presentation as well um, for some, for some Q&A. Erica and I will also be on chat to help answer any questions um, about the admissions process or logistics about the program. Professor Grigas, I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Heather, for uh, the introduction and for uh, organizing this uh, this nice event. So, uh, so welcome everyone. Good afternoon, or um, good morning, or good evening, depending where you are located right now. Um, so, uh, so I want to take uh, a little bit of time to uh, give an introduction to uh, Berkeley, the Bay Area, uh, our department. Um, tell you a little bit about what's happening here, and then also. Uh, tell you a little bit about um, some of the people here, uh, our faculty, our staff, and also our students, and um, and highlight uh, as well some students who have re recently graduated and um, tell you about um, what they worked on during their their studies here, as well as uh, what they're doing now. So um, so let's get started then. Um, so great. So yeah. So I think um, as many of you, hopefully all of you are aware. Um, Berkeley is, is nicely situated uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is really, um, you know, a, a world center for, uh, for innovation in, in high tech data analytics, healthcare design and, and, and other areas. Uh, and I think, um, you know, Berkeley has um, a wonderful academic history, um, but also is, is really um, nicely uh, uh, geographically located um, in terms of uh, uh, many perks like the weather, but also like uh, our connections to uh, to all of these companies. So uh, so many of our students and, and our graduates uh, have had um, work experiences or uh, or many of our faculty have had research collaborations with with companies um, like like some of the many tech companies you see here um, in, across a lot of different industries. Uh, this is really a unique advantage of of the Bay Area, I believe. Um, it's really a sort of hub for technology. So let me speak a little bit about the academic history of the department then. So uh, the Department here of Industrial Engineering um, actually started in the 50s. Uh, so it became originally part of the, uh, it was originally uh, formed as part of the Mechanical Engineering Department, but two years later, um, the department itself was established. Um, and then about 10 years later, it was renamed to the Department of Industrial Engineering uh, and operations research to reflect these sort of two different uh, broad aspects of uh, of what we work on in this department, which I'll describe a bit later. Uh, and then some more recent history. Um, so recently, we've expanded our degree programs. Uh, in 2006, we started our uh, operations research and management sciences program, uh, which is part of the um, the School of Letters and Sciences. So um, in addition to our engineering degree, we also offer this undergraduate degree. Uh, and um, more recently, um, in 2010, we started our first um, professional master's program, which is the Master of Engineering program. Uh, so 2010 was saw our first class of Master of Engineering students. And very, very recently, um, some very exciting recent history 
in um, 2020, this this year right now, um, we are welcoming our first cohort of uh, Master of Analytics students. So, um, so we're very excited about um, all of these new programs. Okay, so let me speak a little bit about um, what exactly is uh, is our department starting with the name. I think probably most uh, or all of you have sort of self-selected so to, to attend this presentation, right? So you probably have some notion of what uh, IUR already is. Uh, I'll just tell you kind of, uh, you know, our, our sort of broad perspective, right? So, uh, so operations research generally um, is about combining optimization, statistics, and stochastics um, to develop mathematical models. Uh, and, and these mathematical models um, are, are, are useful um, for, uh, for optimizing systems uh, and uh, usually under constraints and under uncertainty, um, and also developing algorithms uh, to, to solve uh, these optimization problems, as well as um, to analyze the uh, uncertainty, um, the stochastic uh, aspect, as well as um, using data and, and statistical tools. Um, so operations research kind of, a, you know, in my head is a little bit more on the theoretical side. Um, however, almost all of us and, and almost, you know, many, many people who work in operations research are motivated largely by applications. Uh, and so, uh, so industrial engineering kind of covers um, a broad set of applications that uh, we're interested in uh, in this department. So, um, so industrial engineering is sort of like about using OR methods to uh, improve the efficiency of uh, industrial scale systems. Uh, and, um, and this can be in, in many different applications, logistics, healthcare, energy systems. Um, really, uh, one of the great strengths of, uh, of IOR, in my view, is um, that we develop a broad set of methodological tools that, that can be applied and are applied really to, to many different uh, application domains. So, uh, so in this department, we really, we really do focus on, on both of these aspects. Um, great, so uh, yeah, so here's actually an interesting video if you'd like to take a look after the presentation. Um, this video uh, it was made by some of our, um, our, our undergraduate students. And they uh, they basically give a nice sort of um, explanation of what is IOR um, and uh, and and discuss um, how the school the skills that they've learned um, in their degree program um, can help change the world and, uh, and and discuss their sort of exciting career options. Um, so this is a nice uh, nice little video. I've I've seen it before, and I think I, I recommend uh, anyone to watch it uh, after the presentation. Okay, great. So so as I sort of said, like IOR is about combining theory and applications. Um, so uh, in this department, I think one of the great strengths is actually that most or probably all of our faculty, as well as our students, are really have diverse interests that span both um, theoretical foundations as well as uh, industrial applications. Uh, and I'll cover some of these more in depth in a moment, especially in terms of the faculty interest. Uh, but broadly speaking, the kind of theoretical foundations that we're interested in lie in these three areas of, of optimization and algorithms, uh, stochastics and simulation and, and data science and analytics, which I would say also covers statistics. Uh, so kind of these are our three kind of pillars of uh, theoretical foundations. And then um, industrial applications cover uh, really, as I said, kind of a broad set of areas, um, energy systems, healthcare systems, um, logistics and uh, automation, robotics. Uh, our faculty are, are interested in, in a broad set of um, industrial applications. So, uh, so I think, uh, as I said, I think one of the strengths actually of this department is that we have faculty whose interests bridge both um, the theoretical foundations and the industrial applications. So it's not just like we have half of our faculty working on theory and half of our faculty working on applications. Actually, most faculty are working in both, um, which I think is really exciting. Um, with that said, let me actually cover some of the uh, specific interests of the faculty and our sort of um, broad research areas. So, uh, so here we list these uh, eight different research areas, which you can see uh, on our website. And I'll just kind of quickly, um, you know, go through these uh, eight areas uh, and, and mention some of the faculty who are working in them. So uh, the first is, is like optimization and algorithms, one of our theoretical foundations areas. Uh, and, um, and so uh, here are some of the faculty who are working in this area. Um, professors Adler, Aswani, uh, Adam Turk, myself, Akbam, uh, Lavey, Ubwani, and um, El Gawi. Uh, and, um, and basically, uh, optimization is uh, sort of, you know, um, broadly about thinking about um, mathematical models of decision making and, uh, and, and how to solve these models. 
uh, with algorithms. Uh, and this has applications in, in many different areas uh, and actually you know, spans uh, or bridges to many of the industrial applications as well as actually you know, like statistics and data science as well has seen a lot of applications of, of optimization in, in recent years. So, um, so our research uh, in this area has been funded um, myself, I've been funded by NSF, um, uh, also uh, the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, uh, ONR, and, and IBM, uh, among others. And then, of course, yeah, uh, another of our theoretical kind of pillars is in machine learning and data science. Uh, so here is sort of the faculty working uh, in, in this area. So, uh, so in addition to the faculty I mentioned before, we also have uh, Professor Ken Goldberg and uh, Professor Zayu Zhang, uh, and also Professor Michael Jordan, who is a, a joint uh, affiliated faculty. Uh, and, uh, and so machine learning and data science is, uh, as many of you know, a very exciting uh, area of interest in the last few years, last just 10 or 15 years or so, um, which is really about um, harnessing the power of data uh, to improve uh, um, our, our, our decision making um, in applications like uh, automation, logistics, healthcare, energy, finance, and, and many others. And uh, and so um, so faculty in this area are are um, really thinking about new uh, methodologies for uh, for analyzing data sets and um, and doing things like integrating prediction and optimization models, developing sparse learning models, um, addressing fairness, uh, and, and and several others. So uh, so this is another one of our um, exciting uh, areas. Um, and then finally, kind of like the third major theoretical foundation area is uh, in stochastic modeling and simulation. And, uh, and uh, this list, uh, in addition to um, Professor Aswani and Professor Zhang, who I mentioned before, also includes Professor Guo and Professor Ryder. Uh, uh, in the stochastics area, the uh, emphasis is largely more on um, quantifying uncertainty and, and thinking about um, the effect of uncertainty on uh, systems analysis and also uh, the interplay between uncertainty and, and decision making as well, and uh, and and this um, can have applications from like queuing applications and call centers and cloud computing, as well as finance uh, and and um, and other areas. So uh, so this uh, simulation area is also uh, uh, one of our strengths. And then um, and then finally, getting kind of more into some of the um, uh, industrial application focused areas which, as I mentioned before, sort of bridge to the theoretical areas. Uh, we have some faculty who are interested in robotics and automation. Uh, Professor Ken Goldberg um, is, uh, is one of the uh, uh, faculty in our department. We also have uh, Professor Peter Abiel, who's a, a, a joint affiliated faculty. Uh, and, uh, and their work is, um, you know, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, really um, some of the most uh, uh, actual um, physical engineering work that happens in the department in the sense that they are really building robots and uh, and really thinking about uh, automation uh, in terms of developing uh, uh, new um, uh, new robotics tools uh, and uh, and and they use um, techniques from machine learning and optimization to to achieve this so um, so really uh, quite uh, exciting work uh, and then uh, some of the kind of more traditional um, uh, industrial engineering type of uh, application areas. Uh, one of them includes supply chain systems. So, uh, so supply chain is really about um, analyzing uh, the effective and efficient production and flow of goods and services um, through uh, a supply chain network, uh, and, and thinking about this entire process basically. Uh, and uh, analyzing this, uh, the supply chain really requires um, deep mathematical models that, that incorporate tools from optimization and, and stochastics. Uh, as well as as data, uh, and so some of the faculty who work in this area, who I haven't mentioned, uh, Professor Kaminsky, Professor Leachman, uh, Professor Shen, uh, Professor Udwani, I mentioned before, and, and Professor uh, Yano. So they're all uh, leaders uh, in this uh, supply chain area. And then we also have faculty who are interested in financial systems, um, financial engineering. Uh, broadly, it's about um, using tools from. Uh, from operations research, applied math, computer science, and and so forth, um, to uh, to study uh, financial systems and uh, potentially um, make money or uh, or potentially um, regulate these systems in some way. Uh, and uh, and so some of our leading faculty in uh, in this these areas include uh, Professor Guo, uh, Professor Zhang, uh, and Professor Fleming, uh, as well as Professor Adler and, and Adam Turk also work 
uh, in this area. So um, yeah, so this is another uh, exciting application area. We also have faculty working in energy systems. Again, I would say some of the uh, leading uh, leaders in the area of, of energy systems include Professor LeVay and Professor Oren, um, as well as Professor Adam Turk and Professor Shen. Uh, they're really thinking about uh, how to um, uh, optimally design uh, energy systems, uh, which are uh, very important systems, power systems that uh, uh, we all um, interact with every day when we use electricity, and uh, actually thinking about how uh, how this entire system, the power grid works, is incredibly complex and, and involves uh, very difficult uh, optimization problems and, uh, and very careful models of economics and uh, electricity market design in order to get the the system to work. So we all kind of take it for granted that it works, but uh, but actually there's a lot of very deep uh, and uh, difficult uh, tools and methodologies that go behind these systems. Okay, we also have faculty working in healthcare. Uh, uh, healthcare, I would say, is probably um, uh, um, uh, slightly on the more recent side of, of like in the last maybe 20 or 30 years, people have really been applying OR techniques to healthcare. Uh, and, but it's been very exciting and very fruitful. And uh, healthcare systems are also systems which uh, involve, um, you know, the flow of patients and um, the flow of doctors and and, and thinking about um, um, supply chain issues and other related things. And uh, and so we have some leaders in this area as well, including Professor Aswani, Professor Goldberg, Professor Guo, and, and Professor Ryder. Uh, and uh, and they're really thinking about how to apply OR tools uh, in this domain. Okay, so. Um, here are a few recent highlights of some of the uh, impact of uh, our, our research uh, in practice. So, um, so Professor Guo has had some work about using machine learning to detect early stage uh, cancers and uh, in particular eye cancer, and that was really, uh, really exciting uh, and uh, had received some, um, some media attention. Um, uh, Professor Aswani has had some work about uh, SNAP benefits and um, and um, food insecurity, which is a, which is a very very uh, important issue, um, and then uh, Professor Goldberg has had some uh, work about using uh, robotics uh, for telesurgery um, and and using deep learning techniques to to achieve uh, state of the art results uh, for for doing that. Uh, okay, and then also um, we've had uh, some um, work. Uh, Maybe I'll, one thing I want to mention is about the uh, the AI Institute. So the AI Institute is actually a relatively new um, entity on, on on campus that uh, several of the IUR faculty are involved with. Myself, uh, Professor Hawkbaum, Professor Adam Turk, and several others. Uh, the AI Institute is a joint venture between um, Berkeley and Georgia Tech and uh, USC and several other schools. And uh, the idea is um, it's a sort of institute uh, to collect together a bunch of people who are uh, who are working uh, on optimization and artificial intelligence and, uh, and thinking about uh, the applications in, in several different domains, some of which I've mentioned before. Uh, so this is a very exciting institute that, that has started recently. Um, we've also had some uh, uh, research impact by Professor Shen um, on ride sharing, uh, discussing how ride sharing and taxis can coexist, and also some work of uh, Professor Guo on um, new machine learning techniques to help prevent blindness. OK, so um, so let me show you some numbers that um, may or may not mean too much to you, but uh, but we're pretty we're proud of them. So uh, so these are, are are sort of like, uh, you know, the rankings that we just like to brag about uh, as a department. So um, so we're actually the um, number one top public school um, in uh, industrial engineering uh, of uh, this year, in according to the US News and, and World Report. Um, and um, the number two uh, of America's top colleges in, in 2022, according to Forbes. Um, and uh, sorry, Berkeley is the number one top public school. Um, in terms of industrial engineering rank, we are actually um, number two. Uh, um, and uh, that's, again, the US uh, News and World Report. And, um, and we're the number three um, best engineering school uh, uh, Berkeley is, according to, again, the US News and World Report. Uh, as I mentioned before, yeah, there's this very exciting um, thing that's happening now, uh, this uh, National um, Science Foundation AI Institute for Advances in Optimization. Uh, and this uh, institute, which uh, I'm involved with, as well as Professor Adam Turk uh, and Professor uh, Hockbaum and also a few others in, at Berkeley, 
is, is quite exciting. It's bringing together researchers uh, across um, Georgia Tech, Berkeley, USC, Clark Atlanta University, um, University of Texas at Arlington, as well as researchers in industry and in several companies. Uh, and we're all um, working on different areas of optimization and, and their applications. Uh, and this, I'd say, is a, a quite exciting uh, thing from my perspective to be able to uh, collaborate with uh, with all these people. Uh, also, I think from the student perspective, it's uh, uh, a, a really great thing. So this is providing some funding for our students uh, as well as uh, opportunities for students to engage with um, with faculty and, and with others uh, at these other inst institutions. So uh, so this has been uh, quite exciting um, new development here uh, in the department. Okay, here are some some more numbers that we're proud of, uh, sort of um, showing our uh, enrollment growth uh, for our different programs. So um, in total, our, our enrollment has really been growing uh, quite substantially uh, since um, 2014, uh, and especially um, uh, in our graduate programs and also the upper division uh, undergraduates. Uh, we've really seen some substan substantial growth um, in total, uh, you know, in, in, in compared to um, 2014 to now, or at least 2020 when the last uh, uh, data here is recorded. Um, we basically doubled uh, our enrollment size, um, so so we're we're um, we're really happy about that. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll mention a few more details about some specific people, uh, specifically some faculty who have joined us very recently. So uh, so Professor Rajan Adwani joined us uh, in fall 2020. Um, he obtained his his PhD at MIT. Uh, did a postdoc at Columbia IUR. Uh, and had some summer research uh, experience at IBM Research. Um, uh, Professor Udwani is really interested in um, the interplay between optimization and, and revenue management, I would say. Uh, and uh, he's done some fantastic work um, designing uh, new and um, provably good uh, practical algorithms uh, at this interface uh, and uh, for important problems like resource allocation. Uh, and, and he's really uh, someone who's... Uh, doing foundational important work uh, that is about um, developing practical algorithms, but also theoretically analyzing their performance. Uh, Professor um, uh, Danielle Puritinsky uh, joined us also in 2020. Uh, he is an assistant teaching professor. Um, so, uh, so he also does some research, uh, but he has a uh, teaching professor position. So he, he teaches uh, a bit more than the rest of us, uh, but his research is uh, about reinforcement learning uh, and um, has done work on um, trying to, again, kind of think about um, bridging theoretical issues in reinforcement learning with practical algorithms that that work well. Uh, and so um, he's kind of an expert in, in reinforcement learning. Uh, Professor Thibault Mastrolia joined us uh, last year in, in fall 2021. Uh, he is um, a really an expert in, in mathematical finance. Uh, uh, he, um, in fact, probably should be, uh, we should probably update our website to list him uh, uh, in the finance area. Uh, he is definitely an expert uh, in, in mathematical finance, uh, as well as um, specifically things like stochastic analysis, stochastic control, um, contract theory, uh, stochastic differential games. And, and, and uh, so, so uh, yeah, basically works at the um, interface of stochastics and, and financial engineering and, and is, a, is a leader uh, in this area. Uh, professor Stuart Liu most recently joined us uh, this last year. He's uh, also an assistant teaching professor. Uh, he actually is a, a distinguished uh, alumni of our department uh, from 2017. Uh, he was previously a professor at uh, SFSU, San Francisco State University Business College. Uh, and uh, he has done research um, in uh, supply chains uh, and working with um, data-driven models in supply chains. Uh, and um, teaches uh, classes on in, in decision science uh, and uh, operations management, as well as several other uh, classes that he has begun teaching here. Um, we also have a, a, a lecturer, um, uh, uh, Professor Svitlana uh, Bytrenko. I probably have uh, mispronounced her name, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Um, I haven't had the chance to meet her, but uh, she is a, a lecturer in our department. Actually, uh, she is also uh, executive director at Morgan Stanley. Uh, and uh, I think um, she's teaching some classes in our department in, uh, in financial engineering, uh, which um, is really great uh, as someone who's really bringing some real uh, practical uh, uh, experience in financial engineering to, uh, to our core classes. 
Okay, so here's our, all of our faculty then. And um, uh, so we are, uh, you know, a um, relatively smaller department compared to some others, but I would say we have um, very um, solid strength in all of the um, major areas of, of OR. And like I said, all of our faculty's interests uh, span both theory and application, which is something that I think uh, is, is quite exciting. Uh, let me also uh, introduce uh, some of our, our amazing staff, uh, some of which uh, you've already seen or, or, or met. So Heather uh, is our uh, graduate student services uh, advisor who has uh, introduced uh, this presentation. Um, Erica uh, also uh, has been uh, helping uh, tremendously with this presentation and both of them both of them are really um, working on graduate student services. So, so they're um, mainly here to help uh, support uh, graduate students in the department, uh, which um, is, is very important, uh, very important job. Um, we also have um, Jenny who, who sort of does uh, the undergraduate student services um, and, and, and helps a lot with supporting our undergraduate students. Um, we have um, Vicki, who's our, our finance analyst, um, Goldie, who uh, does communications and is really, um, like developing the website and helping to helping us do marketing and things like that. So she's really doing a fantastic job at that. Uh, and we also have uh, Mick, who's uh, our um, information systems analyst, uh, helps many of us with uh, IT issues and, and other things. Uh, and of course, we have Rebecca, our department manager, who's um, uh, done a tremendous job at, at, at leading the department uh, staff and, and helping um, the department um, with many, many things. So uh, we're all very grateful to have such a, a great um, great solid team of, of staff uh, working with us. Okay, yeah, so in total we have um, about 22 faculty, 24% um, assistant professors, 10% um, associate, 62% full professors, two lecturers, uh, eight staff members, which um, is really fantastic. Uh, we're, we're really glad to have eight very, very good staff members, um, and 504 students. Uh, um, so, um, 215 undergraduates, 44% uh, of them are women, uh, 45 PhD students, 47% women, 13 MS students, 31% uh, women, um, 134 MN students, 56% uh, of them are women, and 77 uh, of uh, MNalytics students, which is our newest program, and 57% uh, of them are women. Okay, um, so uh, one question you, you might have, uh, Given that you attended this presentation, it seems like you are probably most interested in either the MS or PhD program. Um, we do uh, also offer the uh, MEng and M Analytics. Uh, just to clarify the distinction between these programs, um, the MEng and M Analytics programs are really professional degree programs. These are um, terminal degree programs that are focused on uh, preparing our students to uh, to work in industry and to apply. Um, IUR tools um, in different uh, sectors of industry. So, um, so, so it's really uh, these are really um, professional um, terminal degree programs, and uh, and you know these uh, students in these programs are are really not um, uh, allowed to continue on for the PhD. Um, uh, if you're interested in a PhD, you should apply directly for the PhD program. Uh, in terms of the distinction between the MS and PhD, the MS, as you may have noticed on the last slide, is is our smallest program. Uh, in some sense, uh, the MS is um, is unique because the MS students take the same classes as PhD students. So academically, you have the same uh, preparation. But uh, the main distinction is that the MS students, uh, again, it's a terminal degree program. It ends after one year. And, uh, and, and if you're applying for the MS, it's really like you're saying, I'm not interested in doing research. Um, I just want to take these more advanced, um, often theoretical focused classes that the PhD students take, so I can get this, you know, stronger um, theoretical, uh, theoretically focused academic background. But uh, I'm going to graduate in one year and, and work in industry. That's uh, that's the MS program in a nutshell. So uh, so basically, it is probably uh, you know our, our least um, popular program because it's a bit odd. It's 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 you know you're taking these classes that the PhD students are taking, but but it's 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 good if you are interested in. Um, you know, working in industry, but you do want a stronger, more theoretically focused uh, academic background in terms of the classes that you're taking. Okay, uh, let me, uh, in the last part of this presentation, just uh, highlight a few of our recent graduates and, uh, and what they've been up to. So, uh, so, um, so Irene uh, Zarko uh, obtained uh, the MS degree here in 2013. Uh, and um, she's now a, an operations program manager at Google Cloud, 
and uh, works on building infrastructure that that supports Google services. Uh, and um, and I think uh, is is hopefully using the the tools that she uh, obtained here and also learning uh, a newer uh, techniques in IOR to uh, apply at Google. Uh, Quico uh, Spaten was a graduate uh, in um, 2019. Uh, Quico uh, works at Amazon uh, in, um, in the middle mile transportation team, uh, along with several other IUR alumni. Uh, actually, we have quite a bit of people affiliated with Amazon, not only uh, alumni, but also faculty uh, in the department. Uh, and um, uh, Amazon, as you may know, is a huge uh, uh, company, one of the biggest companies in the world. And, uh, and really, they face um, a lot of uh, unique and challenging logistics uh, problems, among many others. So, um, so there are a lot of uh, IOR people working at Amazon. And Quico is, is one of the uh, leaders now uh, on this team uh, on uh, vehicle routing and sustainability. Uh, Meng Kui uh, was a graduate last year. Uh, she actually worked with Max Shen uh, as well as me, but Max was also her advisor. Um, and uh, um, she is now assistant professor uh, of, uh, of operations technology and information um, at the Cornell uh, uh, Johnson School of Business. And uh, Among is, is working uh, at the interface between uh, operations management and, and machine learning, um, and, uh, and also in several application areas. Uh, and I think um, uh, Meng, like um, several others, uh, are some of our uh, distinguished alumni who have gone on to uh, faculty positions in top universities, uh, which um, we're, we're very proud of. Uh, Andres Gomez is another one who's gone on to a faculty position uh, in a top university. Uh, so, so Andres uh, worked with Professor Adam Turk, and uh, he uh, works at the interface of discrete optimization and machine learning, uh, and is now a professor at USC. Uh, uh, Caleb Bug was a graduate last year um, working with Professor Aswani um, on uh, his, his thesis was about uh, long-term intervention strategies and, and um, mathematical modeling and simulation and optimal intervention theory. Uh, he's now a postdoc at, at Georgia Tech. Okay, here's a, a few other uh, places where some of our graduates have gone on. So in the past um, uh, 13 years, uh, so we've had academic uh, placements in the following universities. So uh, just I'll just pick out a couple names, uh, Cornell Business School, Georgia, Georgia Tech, um, uh, University of Texas at, at Austin, McGill University, uh, MIT, um, the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, UCLA, University of Toronto, uh, University of Pittsburgh, um, and, and several others. So we've had, uh, and also Berkeley, uh, we've, we've had uh, some of our graduates go on to academic positions in, in, in top universities uh, across the world. We've also had uh, some of our, our graduates um, go on to top positions um, in uh, in top companies uh, throughout the world. So uh, across many different industries, the tech industry, um, finance industry, um, supply chain logistics industries, and, 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 and many others. So here are um, you know, several companies that our graduates have gone on to. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the data on um, the uh, career placement after PhD, um, about 34% of our graduates go on to academia. Um, the remainder go on to uh, industrial jobs uh, and uh, across different sectors. So about 29% go on to technology jobs uh, in the tech industry. That's probably the largest, that is the largest uh, um, percentage. Uh, and then uh, a good percentage uh, of our graduates go on to jobs in finance, 16%, uh, 4% uh, go on to manufacturing, 4% go on to consulting. And 13% uh, go on to positions in, in data science and, and AI, uh, which um, could also have some relation with, with the other areas as well. Uh, and in terms of job titles, 26% um, uh, are, are, uh, have a job title of professor. 23% um, have a job title of researcher, uh, which tells you that even uh, the people who are going on to industry jobs with a PhD are often uh, having a, a title of researcher or something like that. 10% um, have a title of, of engineer, 14% uh, have a title of financial analyst, and 9% uh, in management, and 18% uh, data scientist. Okay, with that, I think uh, I will hand it over to Erica to talk a little bit in more detail about the degree requirements uh, and the degree overview. So thanks, everyone, for your attention. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Erica, and hopefully you can see me. Um, let me see. Okay. 
All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the degree programs, uh, like uh, the um, more technical details about those programs. So um, on this chart here, you see both the MS and the PhD. You can see the length of our MS program is a year, so fall and spring semester. In the PhD, our normative time is five years. Um, GPA for both, uh, they have a requirement of, of a minimum 3.0 cumulative GPA. Um, and then also for the full-time load, it's uh, 12 units a semester. Um, the total units for the MS program is 24, and 12 of these are um, inside our department, so our IOR courses. They start with that, um, that acronym there, or that um, wording there, indent as the 200 plus courses. Excuse me. Um, and then our total units for PhD, there's not a specified amount as long as they meet the 12 minimum units uh, per enrolled academic term. Um, as far as a preliminary exam or entrance exam, um, the MS program has a comprehensive exam or a research project presentation. And then the PhD students at the end of their first year, they have a preliminary exam. Um, for the uh, PhD program, there's also a qualifying exam, a QE, um, which is taken normally within three semesters of passing the preliminary exam. Um, for advancement to candidacy, um, that's not applicable for our Plan 2 MS students, so those doing the comprehensive exam or the research project. Um, so it's uh, typically more so for the PhD program, um, and it, this is effective the semester after they pass the qualifying exam. And then for dissertation, um, if a student in the MS program decides to do our plan one, our thesis plan, um, the thesis is in the spring. Um, and then for the PhD students, uh, they file their dissertation in their final term uh, to the graduate division. Um, a little bit more about the MS program. Uh, the students take at least one course from each of these groups, the so optimization, stochastic models, and modeling. Um, and uh, they also register, register for, and they attend uh, one of our department seminars. Um, uh, they need to do that for at least one unit uh, in the fall or the spring. Um, and then there's also a two unit limit on the amount of independent research units for the master's program. And then our courses are listed in this table, um, which we can you know, reference on our, we have a, our academic or, uh, course line or outline on line. For the PhD program for the first year, there are um, uh, two required courses that all students take uh, mathematical programming and applied stochastic processes. Um, and then there's some additional coursework students need to take in their first year. They need to do at least one course from group A in the table, at least one from group B, and then at least two courses from group C, which include some, um, a course from our 2 series. Um, and then the students also do need to take uh, the departmental seminar in their first year, either in the fall or the spring. And then um, just as a, a note that for the, the MS uh, and the PhD courses that were included in these tables, uh, these courses are not guaranteed to be offered every semester. Um, and then just kind of like a bigger picture here for the PhD program. Um, Year one, that core coursework that we just talked about, um, the preliminary exam is at the end of the first year in the spring. Um, and then summer research is normally done after the first year. And then students do have that first year to kind of uh, think about who they would like to work with as their advisor. Um, in the second year, students are more focusing on their minor coursework. Um, and then they're also prepping for the qualifying exam and doing some research. Uh, by year three, uh, the students should have their qualifying exam or you know, be uh, working on that if they have not already done so. Um, they can work on some coursework as well and research. Um, and then um, if they have completed their qualifying exam, um, they have a yearly uh, workshop um, that goes along with that until they graduate. Um, so for years four and five, again, uh, they do a yearly workshop uh, presenting um, to their committee, and then um, when they are going to graduate, they have their dissertation research and they file file the dissertation. 
All right, and then we're going to talk a little bit more also about admissions um, and admissions process and requirements. Um, this is kind of like a big overview here, um, just to note that uh, a lot more detailed information is included on our website. So we generally suggest going um, to our website to look at the specifics for the MS um, or the PhD program, whichever one you're considering. Um, the uh, application is all online. Uh, there is a, min, a minimum of 3.0 cumulative GPA. Um, the GRE is a requirement for both the MS and PhD um, applications, as well as for other programs, our Master of Analytics and our Master of Engineering programs. So it's required across the board for the IOR graduate programs. Um, TOEFL uh, required for international applicants with a minimum score of 90. More information about the TOEFL and the GRE is on our website. Um, including the institution code and things like that. Um, for both the MS and PhD program, uh, three letters of recommendation are required. Um, and then also we require a personal statement and a statement of history um, or a statement of purpose. Um, again, I, I know I keep kind of pointing to the website, but we do have a lot more specifics about letters of recommendation as well as the difference between the personal statement and statement of purpose um located there so again strongly recommend uh visiting our website um transcripts are required so a full um uh full disclosure of your academic uh history um as well as uh so the resume piece is not necessarily required but we very high very very highly recommend you submitting a resume um for either the ms or phd program application and just as a note, we do not admit for the spring term, so uh, it's only fall admission. And speaking of that, our fall admit application deadline is coming up in December, so December 15th. Um, it is at 8.59 p.m. PST, so just take a note of that time. Um, so around midnight for Eastern time, uh, those on the other side of the United States. Um, for, again, here's our uh, website, uh, the links here for the master's program as well as the PhD. Um, just as a note, it is a holistic review, so they're taking into, the admissions committee is taking into account all the different pieces of the application, um, and the equity advisor also is involved in the process. Um, decisions are typically released uh, late March, beginning of April timeframe. And there is also a visit day um, for PhD students, um, admitted PhD students that will occur in the spring. All right, and then um, some of you might already be aware of these different outlets to kind of connect with us, but we are on social media as well as our website. Um, you can find additional information about us. Um, as um, you can also reach out to, we have our IUR admissions email address, or if you'd like to reach out to um, myself directly, um, we can help with you have, if you have any questions about the admissions process. But I think now um, we can open up um, for more Q&A. Um, I know we had one question that we'd like to kind of talk about um, in person. Um, and maybe Professor Grigas can help us with that. Um, I'll read this out though. Um, and feel free to put more questions in the, um, in the chat and we can kind of go through these. Um, but the question that we have here is, what are the differences between data science and artificial intelligence? If I want to do a master's degree to explore my interest in a deeper way, which of these two directions would be more suitable for a PhD in the future to study investment related issues? So, um, so Ilgan actually answered that one uh, uh, in the chat, but uh, I'll echo her answer, which I agree with, which is that uh, AI and um, uh, data science and machine learning uh, nowadays these are almost synonyms. Uh, they're they're basically uh, um, umbrella terms that cover broadly about the use of data uh, to um, to uh, you know build model building models uh, uh, based on data in order to um, improve technology and develop um, um, new systems and, and improve decision making. Uh, and I think I think essentially there's uh, there's almost um, um, no difference uh, between 
uh, uh, the focus of of uh, of these you know, different programs with these different names. All right, so we have one other question we'd like to answer live here. Um, so Professor Griegas or one of our students would like to help with this. Um, is it necessary to have research experience for the PhD program? So that's an interesting question, yeah. I think, um, I would say this. So I think, uh, you know, coming, uh, when you're applying uh, without any research experience, you are at a disadvantage compared to our most competitive applicants. Um, most of our, our, our most competitive applicants do have research experience. So, uh, so I'll, I'll say what I say to students who, uh, you know, undergraduate or other students who come to me and ask for advice. Uh, if they don't have any research experience and they're looking to apply to a PhD right now, my usual advice is to apply instead to a master's program where you can uh, possibly obtain some research experience. Uh, you have a better shot of getting into to a master's program. I think than a PhD. It's it's the, it's the, of course there's no guarantee. You may get into to several PhD programs um, without research experience, but uh, you are at a disadvantage compared to the most competitive applicants. All right. So we have another question uh, from an international student. Um, let's see. Um, uh, asking about a departmental code. Um, I do not believe we have a specific departmental code. We just, you just need to use the institutional code that's on our website. Any other questions? And if you have questions also for our students, feel free to um, to drop those as well in the chat or into the Q&A. <laughs> All right, so our, another someone question. Someone asked have. a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, go. go ahead. <laughs> I, I noticed before someone asked a question about like collaboration between different uh, um, faculty, like uh, can you work with multiple faculty um, across both the IUR department and other departments? So I just want to say, yes, definitely, uh, you, that, that's something that people do. Uh, it, it is you know not uncommon. Um, Tor had answered it, so maybe Tor, do you want to provide some more uh, perspective on, on that, like the um, opportunities for students to have collaboration with different faculty? Yeah, I don't have experience working with uh, faculty from other departments, but I, I know some friends who work with uh, people from uh, electrical engineering, computer science, or the business school. Yeah, but you also have to work with your advisor who is in our department as well, yeah. Yeah, so you should have a, a main advisor from our department, mm -hmm. uh, but right. besides that, it's definitely possible to collaborate with, with other faculty. Yeah. yeah, and for me also, I have two advisors, although both of them are in IOR, uh, they're kind of like joined at like coach co-advisors for me. Uh, and like, I, I think like it is one of the aspects that I quite li lo love in IOR is that like, I think faculty is quite open for collaboration. Uh, so like, yeah, I totally feel like felt very free when I choose my advisors in my second year. All right, we have uh, another question here. Um, how common is that students, um, is it that students complete their PhD in less than five years? So if you like already have a master's degree, have industry experience, um, what's the case there? So I can take this one, I, I, um, and then maybe the students can chime in if they have uh, other uh, anecdotal evidence. So my my uh, my feeling is, I think um, even if you come in with a master's degree or something else, you're still taking uh, our classes. So uh, so from that perspective, the master's degree doesn't necessarily accelerate, you know, jumpstart you. So I think I think you know the normative time that people take about five years is is still typical even if you're coming in already with a master's degree and, and industry experience um so so basically i i would say my my uh what, what i have observed is that um the typical um you know phd student experience of five years um the first couple years or so you're, you're focusing a lot on classes and then you start to do your dissertation research work um that's typical and it's usually uh, even if you have a master's degree and in industry experience, um, that's not really going to typically accelerate that timeline. All 
Anyone have anything to add? All right, so we have another question too here. Uh, would you recommend a master's program for someone who is lacking academic research experience but who has industry research experience? So I, I would, um, I, I think, uh, um, depends on the case. So uh, if the industry research experience um, involves some publications and, and things like that, uh, and um, uh, and the publications are, you know, um, in, um, I mean, it depends uh, sort of what, what the publications are and, and what the focus of the research was, but it's, that can be value, a valuable research experience that uh, uh, it can um, prepare someone to do a PhD program. Uh, so in that case, it's it's a little bit unique. But as I said before, like especially someone who has limited or no research experience, I do generally advise to uh, to apply for a master's program. Any other questions? Feel free to drop in the chat or in the Q and A. Okay. Um, do you have any advice on highlighting published research that was done without an advisor or uh, or who could write a recommendation related to it? Uh, should we submit papers themselves along with our application? Uh, that's an interesting situation. Um, so, um, so certainly send us the paper, um, and uh, especially if it was published, we will pay very close attention to that. Uh, I think it's quite impressive for uh, someone who's applying to a PhD program to have done published research uh, on their own without uh, uh, any um, uh, mentorship of, of uh, someone else. That's very impressive, uh, very unusual. So definitely uh, include that in your application package. Um, in terms of like, yeah, the letter of recommendation, um, I guess that could be a little bit trickier. Um, if possible, I, I would say if, if there is, you know, someone who's uh, you're close enough with and who's familiar with your work, uh, if you can obtain a letter of recommendation from, from that person, even if they were not a co-author or a, a mentor on this project, uh, but they're familiar with the project and, and, and familiar with your, your, uh, your work, and maybe you took a class with them at some point or something, and, and they can evaluate the, the, the work, um, that, that would be a valuable letter of recommendation. can answer a few more questions. We got about uh, three minutes here. So any any last minute questions, feel free to uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, perhaps the students can um, share, Tor and Ilgen, if you can remember so long ago, <laughs> any pearls of wisdom you might want to share for those who are applying to PhD programs. Yeah, I actually have a question about um, apply about the application. Um, so suppose I apply to a PhD program, but I get rejected. Th would I be considered automatically for the master's program here? Because I know that some schools, they do that. So uh, I don't think we typically do that. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, because our Master of Science program is is kind of small and and and, and unique. Uh, uh, usually, it's a unique profile of a student who um, is really uh, targeting a, a academic um, uh, like a, academic uh, coursework equivalent to a mm -hmm. PhD student, but wants to go and work in industry after a year. So usually, we don't do that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Or, or Ilgen, do either one of you want to share just a couple of pearls of wisdom as a uh, prospective students are applying? And then I see we have another question as well. Yeah, so about like like some tips for the applicants, you mean? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so so in I think when you write the SOP, um, I think it's important to maybe uh, highlight your research experience and maybe include like some some tools or some methodology that, that you have like applied in your past research experience. And although you might have like a broad um, areas of interest, maybe just try to focus on not too many. I think, yeah. 
um yeah and then on top of that i think like i might suggest them like if you are like currently working on a research project even if like you still like didn't write it as a like manuscript or something or like submit it to a journal i would still like strongly suggest that at least you write down like just prepare a draft of your paper research paper and like just make sure that it is ready to like or available to share with the department in case like they ask for you so that i think it would like uh it would be helpful to uh showcase your research skills and like your background right. to the department in addition to the what in addition to the things that you wrote on your resume and like sop uh yeah i think like a written document like a paper or i don't know like any draft manuscript uh I think it would really help you to strengthen your uh, application package. Yeah, I, I didn't have any any publication, but I also submitted my um, research manuscript along with my application. Yeah, same same for me. Like at that point, it was like almost ready to submit, but still was not submitted. But I still like shared the draft, of course, by taking approval of my past advisors at that time, I shared it with the department at Berkeley. Thank you both. Um, so we have uh, another question in the chat and then I think we'll probably wrap up here. Um, but it says, I really want to do a PhD at Berkeley, but I'm worried I'm not competitive enough. Um, so can I apply for the MS or one of the other masters instead first? So, uh... I would say, um, of course, you can apply for uh, our master's program or other master's programs, um, but you will have to reapply for the PhD program uh, and your application, uh, you know, in, in the next year or, or you know, a year after. Um, your, and your application would be, you know, considered, um, uh, you know, uh, equivalently to everyone else. So there, we don't give any special treatment to uh, our master's students uh, uh, to, you know, then go on to a PhD. Um, you have to reapply for the PhD program and your application will be considered, you know, uh, um, uh, in light of everything uh, in, in a you know, equitable way uh, as compared to everyone else. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up, um, but we uh, greatly appreciate you attending today and hopefully you learned some um, helpful things about our department as a whole, as well as our specific um, MS and PhD programs, uh, the admissions process, the requirements, um, and about uh, just different research opportunities here at Berkeley. Um, if you have any questions, uh, again, we have our um, IUR admissions email address um, on our website, so please reach out. Um, and uh, we can hopefully help you. Oh, yeah, Heather just put that in the chat there. Um, so please reach out um, and uh, we can hopefully get your questions answered if you have any other ones after this is over. But again, yeah, we appreciate you uh, attending today. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and thank you, Tor, Ilgin, Professor Grigas. Thank you very much. If you're comfortable to share your email in the chat in case folks mm -hmm. wanted to reach out to you, you can go ahead and do that as well. Thank you, everybody. Of course. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs> Bye.